Well, praise the Lord. We want to welcome everyone uh, watching on Facebook. Uh, Nikki's going to come and officially welcome you here in just a moment. But we wanted to start with some singing. The praise team is going to make their way up, and we're going to sing this great hymn of the faith. Everyone's going to stand. We will glorify this morning the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everyone's going to stand. I'll say it one more time. Everyone's going to stand. <laughs> Everybody sing it. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah to the Lamb, Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great. One more time, we will glorify, we will glorify the King of Kings, we will glorify the Lamb, we will glorify the Lord, who is the great I am. That's beautiful singing. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. That was a good one, Pat. Thanks for saying good morning back. The rest of you, good morning. It's good to see you with your bright smiles on your faces. Show off those smiles to at least, let's go for four. Four people, smile. Hey, y'all. Hey, good morning. There's my three. Here we go. All right, listen up. I've got a couple of announcements that you may need to know about. After the service this morning, we will have a memorial brick service, and all of you are welcome to come. And it's in a little courtyard by the huge statue of Jesus. So that's where we will be after the service. Um, and at 4 o'clock today, finally here, it is vacation Bible camp. 4 o'clock, Art of Kindness. Um, we're going to turn a lot of kids into artists and talk about the kindness of Jesus. So if you are helping, be here um, around 3, 3.30, so we can get things set up and be prepared and ready for those kids to show up. Um, Tuesday, there is a cookout for the JSU football team, and we are in charge of feeding them. Um, so if you want to help with this, at 2.15 here, you can come and help Miss Patsy. She can't do it all by herself. She is cooking the food, and she needs your help, 2.15. If you're not available at 2.15, be here at 4 o'clock with a dessert in your hand in a disposable dish. If you can't do that, then be here at 5.15. We're going to get there at 5.15? 5.15. Be here at 5.15, and we will travel together and serve the football team at their location. The field house, actually. That's the word I was trying to dig out of my brain. Field house. Okay. 2 15 4 o'clock 5 15 remember that one of those times or all three pick them all right wednesday 10 30 bible study and at one o'clock kiddos or anybody who wants a hip replacement meet me and we will go to the factory and jump on the trampolines okay and really quickly handsome lamar has an announcement to make Good morning. I want to give you a quick update on the R&R &R project. Um, we met uh, this past week and resolved a lot of issues. And uh, one of the things that's going to start happening tomorrow is the painters will begin their work uh, to completely repaint uh, the sanctuary. Um, pr probably one of the biggest things I did want to talk about uh, and make you aware of, uh, the R&R uh, &R committee uh, is proposed to move forward with phase two uh, of the project, which is the windows. Uh, we talked a little bit about that and give you some numbers earlier, but we just feel like uh, you've seen the displays and the samples out front. We've had a lot of positive feedback about that, and so the R&R uh &R committee will be uh, bringing forward 
uh, a proposal in two weeks uh, for the church to take action on to move forward with that project. And what we plan to do is to try to uh, uh, complete that uh, without borrowing any money. Um, we will be proposing to raise our uh, goal uh, to complete the R&R &R work uh, from its current $95,000 to about $150,000. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen the windows, uh, they're worth the money. But the other thing, too, is we've got to do something about the windows. I haven't really paid that much attention to the condition of the uh, current windows until we started talking more seriously about replacing them. And uh, they are really in uh, desperate need of uh, major repair or replacement. Uh, so <clears throat> the plan would be that the delivery on the windows uh, is 90 days. So in just thinking through that, the timing of all that, uh, it would be really nice to have everything completed before we start using the sanctuary. And a perfect time to start using the sanctuary would be the first Sunday in November, which is homecoming. So I think we start uh, kind of focusing on that being our timeline to complete all the work, including the window replacement, ready to start uh, moving back or moving back into the sanctuary for the homecoming service. So again, we'll have a, a formal proposal on that in your hands by next week and try to take action so that we can uh, meet that 90-day timeline to get it all done ready for the uh, first week in November. So just wanted to, to share that with you. Thanks. Thank you, Lamar. Two more announcements. I'll be fast. Um, Friday, youth, we will be going paddle boarding at Gad Rock. So if you are interested in doing that, see me and I'll give you some details. And um, if you are available after the brick memorial service to come back in here and help me set up a few tables, that would be great. I would hug you. All right. So let's begin our time together with prayer. Please pray with me. Lord, we have come into your place of worship. Let us give our all to you and may the words, the music, everything that we hear be from you. May those words make us active and encourage us to go out, out of these walls and into the world and to be an example of your love. May you be with those that are, are not here this morning. They're in pain and they're grieving or going through troubled times. May they feel your presence. We ask your blessings on the Memorial Brick service and all that's going on today, the Vacation Bible School. And as the children come in, may they hear about your love. And we love you, Lord. We are so blessed and we thank you for that. And may we always remember that it is your will. Nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. Amen. And let's continue the singing. You can remain seated for a little while, all right? This is um, one of the great hymns of the faith dealing with Calvary and what happened at Calvary. And I want you to sing it, all right? At Calvary. <laughs> and pride caring not my Lord was crucified knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me now my heart and soul found liberty I'd go Yeah. 
I love this lyric. And so many times it happens all the time. Every Sunday in every church, we sing these songs we're familiar with, and we just kind of skip over what the lyrics mean and what they're saying. Listen to this. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. And oh, the grace that brought it down to man. This is my favorite part. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. There was a mighty gulf between us and God. And that gulf was taken care of at Calvary. Isn't that beautiful? Can we stand and we're going to sing this last verse. All right, sing it. Oh, the salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to Our scripture reading this morning is Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your, your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work, at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a, of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you may also you also must be glad and rejoice with me. Going to make their way up, and the choir is going to join us here on the stage uh, for the first time in probably a year or more. 
Um, this is a great, great song that we haven't sung in a long time. We're going to try it this morning. It just says, who can satisfy my soul like you? The, the answer, by the way, is no one can satisfy your soul like Christ. All right, listen to this great song.
great song, and we don't even need a sermon after that. You wish. I want to know how many of you grew up going to Bible school. Let me see your hands. You know, a lot of boys and girls through the years, first time they really learned about Jesus was at Vacation Bible School. It's a powerful, uh, powerful instrument for the church that uh, helps to tell the story in a number of ways. This is going to be an exciting place. I hope you saw what's, uh, what's at the entrance of the, the gym today, all the work that Nikki's done. She's done a tremendous job. We ought to be very thankful for, for what she's done. It's going to be fun around here. Uh, there'll be children, you know, screaming and, and teachers crying and uh, artistic exhibits exploding. It's going to be... It's going to be great. And you pray for this afternoon because it will be a great opportunity for us to share the message about Christ, his kindness, his compassion. Uh, We're going to enjoy being together. So you pray for that today, if you would. Shifted gears a little bit uh, in the sermon today. Again, reflecting on what I've been hearing from many of you in the conversations that we've had, the issues, the concerns, the dreams, the expectations, all of that wrapped up into who we are. And so today's sermon is entitled Breaking from the Past, Breaking with the Past. Um, I think for all of us, we, we could honestly say there are things we wish we had done differently, things we wish we would have said differently, things we wish we had said that we didn't say, and things we wish we had done that for whatever reason we chose not to do. We can all reflect on that. But the theme today is that we learn from the past, but we don't have to live there. If we're stuck in the past, how in the world are we going to move forward? How are we going to take advantage of today and tomorrow if all we're thinking about is yesterday? We don't live back there. That doesn't mean we can't gain from our experiences. And if we're maturing, developing people, we realize that oftentimes the things that maybe are not so positive are great teachers. I think for most of us we could say we've learned more from our stumbles, our failure, than we did from our successes. Success is not always a great thing. I mean, we would all like to be successful. But in truth, sometimes our success can give us a wrong impression, as if we're really better than we are. I think that's a part of what Paul was trying to say to the Philippians, to have an honest estimation of themselves. There were things they needed to let go of. They lived in a hostile environment. They couldn't do a thing about that except begin to move forward and penetrating their their environment with the gospel. If their lives were changed, they desired for other people to experience the same thing. That ought to be your, your drumbeat. If your life has been changed by Jesus Christ, how can you keep that to yourself? There are people outside these doors, and maybe some people inside these doors, who need to hear the message that our past doesn't have to define us. That there's so much more about us than what happened some time before. You heard the scripture today, and I want to focus on a couple of things as we make ourselves Uh, aware of what I think Paul's message is, not just to the Philippians, but to you and me today. First of all, let's just be real. We as Christians, we know more than we're willing to do. Would you agree with that? We know more than we're willing to do. Now, you could either nod or shake or grunt, whatever you'd like to do here, but I'd like some response. Do you know more than you're willing to do? I do. I'm in that case. I imagine you are too. We know more. If you've been in vacation Bible school, Sunday school, you've come to church, you've probably heard a lot of sermons. I'm sure you remember every one of them. One of the mistakes I learned early was never to ask somebody what I preached on last Sunday because I normally got a blank stare. You preached last Sunday? There are things that we know to be true. We know that loving someone who loves you back is great. 
But we also know as believers in Jesus Christ that we're supposed to love those who may not love us back, who may be very hard to love. How can we do that? Not under our strength. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Which simply suggests that if I'm going to be effective in my Christian witness, it's got to be under his power, not mine. His wisdom, not mine. We're not that good. We can't do it on our own. So let's be real about something else. We have examples to follow, if we will. Now, I've, I've been here such a short time, but I, I continue to hear stories about some of the men and women who have shaped this congregation through the years. There are some towering figures who have been a part of this congregation, who made such a difference, not just in the church, but in the community and beyond. They have set examples for us. Now, I had a pastor when I was younger who set an example for me that I did not want to follow. He once said to his congregation, because there had been some complaints that he didn't go to the hospital to see folks, and he said to his congregation, you don't want to be that sick. Now think about the implications of that. You mean you're going to show up when I'm at death's door? Is that what you're telling me? That that's the only time I matter to you? Now see, that was an example I chose not to follow. Because I think people are more valuable than that. So yeah, there's some of those kind of examples we choose not to follow. But what about the ones we should? Today, on July the 11th in 1921... Betty Howell was born. If she had lived, she'd be 100 years old today. She was my mom. She was the kind of person who always looked for the underdog. I remember that um, she was very involved in the international ministry of, of our church, and she had a particular interest in those who had come from Japan. Now, in those years, which was about 20 years after the end of World War II, there was still a lot of hostility toward Japanese people. But mom had a particular interest in trying to make them feel at home. And it wasn't unusual for us to have a meal with our guests who were all Japanese. And you know how you talk to somebody uh, who speaks a different language? You talk louder in English. Surely they'll get it, right? But what I loved about her was she had an eye for people who might not matter to others. You may know somebody like this. She'd take us to the grocery store. And I've told you a little bit about this. Well, she wouldn't really take us to the grocery store. She'd take us to the parking lot of the grocery store and say, I'll be back when I'm finished. There are three boys in that car. She rolled down the window, which we really appreciated. It. But she said, this was her parting words. Don't kill each other. Three boys in a car. And we waited. And we waited. And we waited some more. Because we were absolutely convinced that before my mother, our mother, left that grocery store, she would have met and talked to every person in that store. Now, why would she do that? Because every person mattered. Now, that's an example worth following. Now, here's one, another one. And let's be real about this. We each have to take responsibility for the faith we claim. Nobody else can live your walk in Christ for you. You are accountable for the way you live every day. Now, is that frightening? Is that intimidating? Yeah, perhaps a little. But it's also exciting. It is true, and I've said it, and you've heard it many times. You may be the only Jesus that people might get to know. What kind of Jesus will they get to know if they come to know you? I want you to listen to what Paul wrote. We just heard it. Rhonda read it. 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I got to tell you, there were times when I, I really struggled with that verse. Work out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What, is, what, what does Paul mean? Now, I want you to remember the context. Remember how he starts this portion of his letter? He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What's he saying? That I have responsibility for my faith. Now, I can't save myself. That's not what Paul's saying. And I can't add a thing to what Jesus did on the cross we sang about at Calvary. We can't add to that. So what is he suggesting? Every day's a gift. Every relationship matters. Every moment we're allowed to breathe, to live on this earth, we get to make some choices. What is he saying? Work out your faith and your salvation in fear and trembling. Continue to live in obedience. It isn't enough to say, I love Jesus. It isn't enough to show up at church, maybe every week, or to do all those religious things that we can list. There needs to be something different about us. The way we treat people. Yesterday, um, I stopped at a restaurant and was making an order. And before I made the order, my wife and I were getting a sandwich while we were out shopping, which I love to do. Oh, gosh. I hunt. I don't shop. But that's another story. So I walk up to the counter, and this woman, this young lady, is standing behind the register. She had the sourest face I, I think I've seen in a long, long time. I could tell she was having a wonderful day. And so before I gave an order about the food we wanted, I began to talk to her as a human being, and I smiled at her, and I asked her how she was doing, and you know what happened to her? The sour face went away. We had a conversation, and by the time it was over, she had a beautiful smile on her face. Now, that's not a tribute to anything I did. It's the, it's the reality that every day we get a moment, every day we get an opportunity to lighten somebody's load, to show what Christ would do in similar circumstances. Throughout the gospel, we're, we're studying the gospel of John on Wednesdays. Love to have you come. Doesn't cost a thing except a little time. But we're tracking Jesus as he encounters people. And so often it's a, it's a moment he seizes. An opportunity that takes full advantage of. You and I have those moments. But we can get so busy doing our own thing. Attending to our own agenda that we miss those moments. You know it. If you could travel back just a few days into this past week, I promise you, you could identify some moments that you missed or some that you took advantage of. We have personal responsibility for our faith. Now, Paul said something interesting in, in this passage, in this ch uh, chapter 2. He told those Philippians that help was on the way. Help was on the way. Now, you need to understand, this is late in Paul's life. He's in, he's in prison in Rome. He's in, uh, under house arrest in Rome. He doesn't have long. He knows that. So he thinks back about these Philippians. Remember how the letter starts? I thank God for every remembrance of you. But he wanted to make sure they knew that he still had a vested interest in them. Now, I can't come to you. But I hope to send Timothy. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 16, you'll discover that Timothy was a part of the mission team that helped start the church in Philippi. You also learn about another man. His name is Epaphroditus. Now, I don't know how you decide to name your children. Don't do that. But you know what's interesting about it? Epaphroditus, it, it, it means belongs to Aphrodite which is a mythical god, a pagan god. This man had come out of that kind of background, and he found Christ. And it made such a difference that he wanted to be involved. He wanted to serve. He wanted to make a difference. The Philippian church decided, because Paul was in prison, that he needed some help. 
And so they put together a care package. Maybe you've done that for a student away at college or something, but you can imagine what might have been in it. But part of it was a monetary gift. The Philippians were not wealthy people. Do they sacrifice because of what Paul meant to them? Epaphroditus was the man who took the care package to Paul. And then he wanted to come back to the Philippians because that's where he wanted to serve and lead. He was like the pastor of the church. But in the process, he got deathly ill. So much so that Paul was very concerned whether he was going to survive. So at the end of chapter 2, he says, Epaphroditus is on the men. He can't wait to get back to you. God has a way of sending the right people at the right time to build up his church. Aren't we praying for that right now? Are we asking God to bring to us a shepherd who will take us to a new adventure, to a new chapter, to make our church more meaningful, more cohesive, more committed to taking the name of Jesus into this neighborhood and beyond. Help is on the way. We just, we just confirmed a group of people who have agreed to serve on a pastor search committee. You pray for those folks every day. That's not an easy task. I'm pretty convinced, Lynn, that in heaven there's a special place for pastor search committees. I think they get some kind of bonus. Chocolate chip cookies. I don't know what it is. You pray for them. Folks, help is on the way. God knows exactly what this church needs. Not only is help on the way, help is in here now. I, I compiled a list of those that you said were leaders here in this church and potential leaders here in this church. You look around. And you can find people that you know are doing the things that are strengthening this church right now. And you can also see people who haven't had an opportunity to step up or just need to be asked. Help is here. Help is on the way. Paul said to those folks in Philippi, you're not forgotten. I'm, I hope I can get Timothy there. there. Epaphroditus is coming back. He, he's finally getting strong. Help is on the way. And why is help so important? Because Philippi was a place of darkness, spiritual darkness. I don't know how you view things that are happening in our country, in our world, but this world, this country, this community needs more light. Now, where's that light going to come from? Jesus says in John, he says, I am the light of the world. Okay. He's the source of light. But then he says in Matthew, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. So if I'm taking responsibility for my own relationship with the Lord, I understand that I'm supposed to reflect the light of Christ in my life. Don't hide your light. Don't, don't cover it up. Live boldly. For Jesus Christ. God desires for us to feel his pleasure. I've mentioned this man before, and I'm sure you know his story. He was an athlete who was on the Olympic team in 1924. The Olympics were held in Paris, France that particular year. Here we are about to launch into the Olympics in Tokyo. Eric Little was um, the son of missionaries. His parents had served in China for many, many years. He got his education and was determined that maybe one day he'd go to the mission field. But man, he could run. He could run so well that he was favored to win the 100 meter race and win the gold. And the problem was that uh, that race was scheduled for Sunday. And Eric Little didn't run on Sundays because it was a Sabbath day. 
And they tried everything they could to convince him to run for the country, you know, do something for England. He said, no, I, my relationship with, with the Lord is the most important thing in my life. And you know what? When I run, I feel God's pleasure. And that, that was a, a phrase, a, a sentence that sort of stuck out of that Chariots of Fire movie that you might have seen, an Academy Award winning film. But you know what's interesting? That it wasn't just about him competing in the Olympics in a different race that he was not used to running and yet he still won. It was the race he ran after the Olympics of 1924. He did go back to China. And he did serve as a missionary. And the Japanese arrested him and put him in a concentration camp. And there he continued to serve, trying to keep the spirits of people up, doing little things for people to give them some sense of hope. He wore himself out. And the phrase he began to say was not so much, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. It became, I surrender. He said, why, he was asked, why, why do you do what you do? Why are you trying to help other people? Don't you know that you can get exchanged because of who you are? The Japanese will let you go. No. There was another person in that camp who needed to go, a woman. He was expecting a child. So he refused so that she could find freedom. Why are you doing this? Because it's complete surrender. As he was breathing his last, he couldn't say that word again, but he tried. Surrender. Surrender. He couldn't say it. And he died. What do you and I need to do to feel God's pleasure? Probably not compete in the Olympics. I think I've been disqualified. But you know, there's a race that you're running right now. Are you running to the best of your ability? You need a second wind? Can you dig deep? Try a little more? Because is it worth it? To put your hands, your life in the, in the grasp of, his, of the Savior? You and I have to make that choice. But it begins with something that's trite almost. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. For Eric Little, it wasn't the glory of the Olympics, a gold medal around his neck. It was feeling God's pleasure in whatever he did. What have you done lately? And you know God's pleased. He's looking down at you and saying, well done. Isn't that what we want to hear when we enter the gates of glory? Well done, good and faithful service, servant. Welcome home. Have you felt God's pleasure? Oh, he so much wants you to do that. He wants our light to shine. Because I will tell you this, light still beats darkness every time. You've got to decide on what matters most. We've got to realize that not everybody has our best interests at heart. You can't live, stand up for Jesus and not be a target. Not going to be easy. People laugh at you, scoff at your silly beliefs. Why in the world would you give up a Sunday morning when you could be home at, in bed, you could be fishing, you could be at the lake, you could be doing this and that? What in the world are you doing here? Was your coming here today by somebody else's decision? Oh, yes, you are going to church. And you are going to stay awake. Even the preacher puts you to sleep. We have to understand that the moments that God gives us, we can't reclaim. You know what you can't more, make more of? You can't make more time. This is it. 
your one and only life. We have to decide on what matters most. And maybe there are some things that we need to discard. Maybe we've learned that from our past. There's some behaviors or some attitudes that don't honor us at all. How do we break from the past? I ran into an interesting article by a woman named Rose Costas. The article is Breaking the Chains of the Past. And this is what she said. She said there are eight things you can do. First of all, you call them by name. I can remember. I can remember mistakes I've made. And they're hurtful. Hurtful to me, hurtful to the people that they affected. I'm not going to pretend they didn't happen. Because I'm imperfect. If you looked in the mirror, maybe you need to do that this afternoon. Look in the mirror and say, I, I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. But I'm on a journey. I'm going to get healthier. I'm going to be more joyful. I'm going to have a heart for other people. I'm going to be more compassionate. It starts with a reality check. The second thing she mentions is respect your past mistakes. Some of the mistakes that I made made me better, wiser, stronger. The third one was do not devalue your achievements. Yeah, maybe you didn't do it perfectly, but you got it done. I'm not a handyman. My older son is. So if I got a project at home, I call him. I've seen what I can do. My wife says, you know, it'll be a lot less expensive. Just call a workman. Just, just go ahead and do that. Save us all some money and me some frustration. But don't let your mistakes be your story. I am not defined by my stumbles. Do not ruin your present life with the past. I've seen so many people who do that. They cannot get over some error, some mistake, some failure. It haunts them, and they allow it to happen. Turn it loose. Don't miss the lessons of your past. Forgive so you can move forward. If you were to make a list right now, who are you angry at? Who did you wrong? Who hurt you? Now, if that's what you continue to dwell on, guess what? You're not hurting them. You're hurting yourself. That's what anger does, resentment, bitterness. Let it go. Remember, if we expect God to forgive us, the sinners that we are, then he also expects us to forgive others, the sinners that they are. Boy, you talk about liberation about set, being set free, turn it loose. It might be years past. They might not even be alive anymore. They hurt you. They let you down. They disappointed you. They lied about you. Whatever it might be, you're not going to gain a thing by allowing that to be a part of your today. And the last one is use your past mistakes to help others. Boy, that's a big one. You think, well, I'm going to try to teach my children not to do certain things. Don't touch that stove. Why? You'll burn your hand. What does your child do? Touch the stove. We're hard-headed. But there are things we learn we hope to pass on. We'd like the way to be a little easier for those who come after us. I started by saying we, more, we know more than we're willing to do. There was a, a pastor at First Baptist Church in Tallahassee a number of years ago. His name was C.A. Roberts. He was a fantastic preacher. College students came from everywhere. Every service was packed. He was dynamic. He was charismatic. One day he stood up in his pulpit and he had his Bible in his hand. And he he began to read some passages, you know, some of those really hard ones, you know, love your enemies, that kind of stuff. And he had his Bible in his hand. He said, 
you know what, we don't believe that. And he took the pages of his Bible and ripped them out and threw them on the floor. How do you think the congregation responded? <gasps> you just desecrated the word of God. Now, we desecrate the word of God when we don't live according to what it tells us. How our lives can be more meaningful if we'll follow the Lord's commands. Those commands are not to, to limit us. It's, they're, they're there to free us. To break from the past. We are no longer condemned, the Bible says. We have been saved by grace, not by our efforts. If we could do it by ourselves, Paul says in Ephesians, all we do is be boastful about it. We brag, look what I did. I have to say, I tell you, I haven't done a thing that added to my salvation. Jesus did it all on the cross. But I don't have to go to the cross. He did that once and for all. But now I need to cherish the gift he gave me. Friends, we are blessed beyond measure. We are children of God. We have been adopted into the family of the Heavenly Father. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Is that because I went to church most of the time? Or I gave a lot of money? Or I served on a lot of committees? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Continue to live in obedience so that you can honor the salvation that you have not earned. What a difference we can make if we live as liberated people. We can learn from the past, but we don't have to live there. I used to sing a song, I bet you did too. No, I'm not going to sing it. Relax. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Now, Joe Namath put it a little differently when he said, I can't wait till tomorrow because I get better looking every day. If you've looked at Joe Namath lately, it ain't working. <laughs> every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. That's what he wants for you, for me that we might experience his joy and show the world. Let's pray. Father, in humility we, we confess. Oh, we get bothered by some of the dumbest stuff. We spend a lot of energy on things we can't change. We try to relive what can't be relived. And we have a hard time letting go. But the cross says that we're not to live in the past. We're to look to a glorious future that was bought with an awful price. And because of what you have done and continue to do in our lives... We have hope, we have confidence, we have peace, and we have joy. As we live in that environment, people are going to take notice, and they're going to wonder, what's different about that man, that woman, that youth, that child? They must know something I don't know. Well, it re isn't really something, it's someone. Help us, Lord, to share light in the dark. Because our church can be a beacon. Bless us, Lord. Help us to be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to sing. And you sing it if you mean it. If you don't mean it, just sit there. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's not a one-time thing. Because every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Pat's going to lead us. Let's stand together. I'll be right down here if you need me.
Yes. 